I'm going to present material from a journal article that is available to the conference and is um, in the Religions Journal. Uh, I'm going to present the main flow of the article, but all citations and references are available uh, and in the article itself. Children and spiritual care is the main topic. Children want to talk about what really matters to them. They need adults who listen to and observe them. Spiritual care understands how thinking itself works. Spiritual care aims to make the world a better place. Spiritual care includes spiritual style preferences in a child's learning environment, and I will explain those toward the end. So there's some basic assumptions I make about spirituality. I define human spirituality as a sense of felt connection or as a felt sense of connection. Most definitions of spirituality include the idea of connection. Spirituality is a natural human capacity. A felt sense of connection has three moving parts. There's an agent of someone, an object, someone or something, and there's the meaning that develops between them. Spirituality relies on and makes use of object relations theories. American psycho psychotherapist Anna Maria Rizzuto studied the theory of object relations that Sigmund Freud uncovered. Freud wanted to know how people come to possess an actual belief in the existence of God. His theory of object relations answers that question. Object relations theories explain our need for others. They are theories about our relations to the objects, the people and things to which we are attached and which give meaning to our lives. Rizzuto demonstrated how objects that come our way illumine the formation of God concepts. Her research helps explain the formation of all concepts that populate a child's worldview or your worldview and mine, with one important difference that I will go into. The term God concept designates a union of ideas, feelings, and images each person associates with God. Images and ideas are acquired early in life. The first conscious God representations appear between the ages of two and three. God concepts blend feeling charged images with intellectually rich ideas to form a concept with cognitive and effective dimensions. God concepts, the difference with God concepts is that they are transitional objects, unlike many other concepts in a worldview. Rizzuto asserts through her research that every human being constructs a concept for God. There is no such thing as a person without a God concept. To her, each person produces an idiosyncratic, highly personal concept for God derived from one, object relations experience, two, an evolving self-image, and three, environmental systems of belief. Based on her research, a God concept cannot be made to disappear. It can only be repressed, transformed, or used. Children th learn through experience to trust or mistrust God. Parents, teachers, significant others, sanctuaries, religious communities, television programs are some examples that influence a child's notion that God is either dependable, good, kind, or is the opposite. God concepts show up even in children who have no religious training. The human spirit creates meaning 
based on object relations experiences that shape our lives. Over time, meaning shifts with new experiences. All meaning making moves through experiences of loss and recovery. As mentioned though, not all concepts are created equal. Rizzuto realized that loss and recovery are necessary for growth and maturity in our concepts. She names four God concepts that she discovered in her research. There are adults who have a concept for a God whose existence they don't doubt. There are those who wonder whether to believe in a God they aren't sure exists. There are those who are amazed, angered, or quietly surprised to see others deeply invested in a God that does not interest them at all. Struggling with a demand, some people struggle with a demanding, harsh God they would like to get rid of if they weren't convinced of this God's existence and power. In research on children's spirituality, many children tend to have a view of God as good, kind, powerful, all-knowing, and protective. A child's sense of self is affected by their God concepts, so that God personally created is like a piece of art, a painting, or a melody, conveying what we've done, seen, been. God concepts continue to influence one's sense of self. Once created, God concepts, dormant or active, remain potentially unavailable, uh, potentially available, I'm sorry, in a continuous process of meaningful integration with experiences the child continues to have with things, people, and with God. Like transitional concepts for big concepts like mother and father, God concepts can grow up. They can become more fully informed educationally and experientially. From the time we're little, my parents chose a kitchen doorpost to record the heights of my brother, sister, and me. At any time, we could look at the doorpost and see how our heights had increased. Oh, that's how old I was, how tall I was when I was five. You know, my brother is taller than me all the time. Transitional God concepts are meant to grow like the lines on that doorpost to show how we are moving and growing intellectually through our experiences. As children age, there are interrelationships among God concepts, the living God and self concepts, so that experience influences both self and God concepts. Throughout a child's formation, God's God concepts, the rhythm of loss and recovery, attachment to others, for example, parents, grandparents, teachers, all are instructive to a child's spiritual growth. If children have negative, frightening God concepts, an intervention that takes no account of that meaning can produce effects than are, that are more than children can bear and signals a serious lack of spiritual care. For children to receive spiritual care, they need to be in consistent loving relationships with people who meet physical, emotional, and psychological needs, particularly during affect attunement, an intimate form of communication between adults and infants or between adults and children, which begins in gaze behavior. Mirroring is the first step in gaze behavior. For example, as mother and infant to interact, if a mother's face is unresponsive, the mirror, her face, is a thing to be looked at, but not into. To create a healthy sense of God's identity and a happy self-concept, an infant's gaze must pass through the mirror 
mother's face to where the real mother dwells. The child needs to sense there is something more than a face to look at. Behind a face is a person with an interior psychic reality that a child looks at and looks into, grounding their belief in their own interior self. A positive experience with affect attunement and attachment forms hope and trust in a child's heart. Through attachment, self-concepts and God concepts can grow up. Spirituality is a human capacity based on a felt sense of connection to transitional objects allows children's spiritual experience to inform daily life. Meeting a, child, a child's spiritual needs secures these connections. Every human being has a spiritual need to celebrate, mark significant moments, bear witness to truths learned about life, play, tell their story, pray, grieve, mourn, lament, connect with the past, make significant journeys, express themselves symbolically, convey emotion authentically, seek purpose and meaning, ask ultimate questions, have a satisfactory way to think and speak about the beginning and the end of life. Survive, flourish, experience longing and enjoy its satisfaction. Relax, cope with life circumstances, enjoy the beauty of the, wor of the world, be seen, be heard, have a name that's remembered, be part of a larger community, Organize experience meaningfully to make sense of it. Maintain human dignity and see the future as hopeful. British psychologist Josephine Klein composed a picture to help us understand how we come to identify as ourselves and form our picture of the world. The way she explained it, Identity slowly forms to include aspects that create the situation we find ourselves in, which evolves through, during interaction with others. If conditions are favorable, infants fuse with mother and don't distinguish themselves from her. Over time, an infant emerges into a self. The term emerge refers to coming out of this merged connection. Somehow a baby has to emerge, come out of the merge. As babies emerge, so does mother. If all goes well, a baby becomes aware of itself as, a distinct, as distinct from mother, as evidenced when babies make strange with people they don't know. Emerging is a foundational experience for comprehending all other objects in the world, including other people. At first, a child is a stream of sensations or the stream is the child. The mother acts as a skin might do before the infant has developed what one might call its own skin, something to contain all its fluctuating sensations. If all goes well, mother acts as a container, a primary nurturing containment for the child's stream of sensations until the child becomes aware of its own skin. If she's able, mother holds her child through gay's behavior until a flow of input is steady enough for long enough to allow pattern making and pattern recognition in the child. Some organization and structuring then takes place for the child. Mother helps put things in perspective. If all is well, this process takes place between mother and child. Mother and infant are active agents within and during it. There is also research data now um, on interactions with fathers and babies as well. Worldviews form from infancy 
based on conceptual learning. The stream of sensations entering an infant brain activates nerve cells. As a result, nerve cells or neurons converse with one another. They send electrical impulses to one another so that one nerve cell excites another. These messages continue to move from neuron to neuron among networks of nerve cells to form a communication system within the human body. As sensations enter the brain, they excite some nerve cells that are linked to the external world through a child's organs, eyes, ears, and to various parts of the body. For example, when bones or muscles change position. This brain activity is the basis for a child's ideas about the world. The process is a source of learning and establishes memories and constantly provides infants and children with knowledge they accumulate about the world and about their place in it. A second set of nerve cells is linked to each other, not to the external world. This second set is responsible for conceptual learning that forms concepts for mother, God, father, to name some of the concepts that populate a worldview. Communication among this second set of neurons makes conceptual learning possible. In forming a worldview, concepts do not erase percepts. There's perceptual learning and conceptual learning, and they have a relationship with one another. And percepts remain available so that we have ongoing access to them. And that's partly how our concepts change when we begin to see and hear more of what's in an environment than we saw five minutes earlier. In conceptual learning, there are two aspects of a worldview called a map and a model. As experience grows, a map slowly forms in the child that consists of concepts and connections between these concepts. The map is not two-dimensional, it's multi-dimensional. It defines the relationship of everything to everything else. Mental maps are complex and have depth um, and meaning. But at birth, there is no map. Infants can't organize their picture of the world in adult fashion because not enough has happened to get more than a blurry sense of what's going on. As learning accumulates based on inherited and personal experience, their internal meaning system contains three elements, a sense of self, a sense of other people, and things, and a sense of what goes on between the two, an agent, an object, and the meaning developing between them for the child. Children in the same family develop different meanings. Classifying concepts occurs in the brain at the, as the same entering event has the same effect whenever it occurs. So concepts are the means for developing insight. Slowly, a children develop a multidimensional understanding of the world, other people and themselves. This understanding comes through concept formation that eventually produces patterns that children hold in their worldviews. A second aspect of a worldview is the model. So there's the map and there's the model. The model is an event in a particular moment in the child's experience. Map and model each contain a self-concept. The model is experienced within the map. The map is its background. A child begins to adjust to elements in a, of a given moment or model that are active during social interaction. The map has its full effect on how a given moment is read by the child. 
Suppose John takes away Billy's toy at daycare. Billy responds based on map and model congruence. Billy may have learned to share fairly, speak his needs clearly, or he may constantly have toys taken away at home. In the last case, Billy may believe I'm someone who doesn't get to keep the toys I want. Children test incoming experience against the map, their worldview, and their sense of whether a model is like or unlike the map. The map is the familiar against which a given moment is scrutinized. Billy can judge whether having his toy taken away resonates with how things should or how things shouldn't be. The map is the standard into which having his toy taken away by John must fit. If a, the event matches the map, even if Billy's experience has been harmful to him, Billy can let it go. It's simply the way things are for him. But if an event is unlike the map, Billy may sense something must be done about the mismatch. A process of testing and finding congruity or incongruity is carried out until the model, the given moment, is like the map. Spiritual care seeks to understand the meaning of the event for Billy. Each world map is constructed from experiences that are not available to other people, even those who are close. As we encounter Billy and aim to care spiritually for him, we have no sense of the whole map that st stands behind a given moment for him. We gain no access to that map except by listening to the meaning of his actions, by observing him over time, by conversing with him, by learning something about his family. If children experience dissonance between map and model, they may react with what looks like defensiveness or anger. It might not be defensiveness or anger, but rather an urge to correct the model so it fits the map. In a mismatch, children easily feel upset, expressing big feelings. A child's skill with self-regulation is important in how they address a mismatch. This is an opportunity for spiritual care. Caregivers observe Billy with curiosity rather than judgment, without thinking, oh, they know what's happening, without pausing to reflect. Of course, if one child hurts another, intervention is essential, but not without reflecting on the model map relationship as soon as it's possible to do so. Carefully hearing and observing the boys is an opportunity for them both to perceive more in the situation than either boy brought to it. Recall that percepts, new observations, are available to help the boys shift their concepts about sharing and equality. Suppose Billy has toys taken away unfairly at home. Adults can engage with the boys to hear the meaning each attaches to their actions. Spiritual conversation aims to make the world a better place. A learning environment can offer a child opportunities to stop, think, look at, and look for what they haven't yet noticed. Four types of literacy help children read situations and reflect on their experience and on their concepts to gain a broader perspective and to improve a situation and make the world a better place. Spiritual care plays a pivotal role as children's worldviews expand during, during learning so that new possibilities show up to them. 
As adults engage conversationally, they initiate the young into brainstorming options to offer balance for worldviews formed on personal experience alone. In spiritual care, the first move is to listen and realize what children need next. Spiritual caregivers want to help Billy and John make the world a better place. With this goal in mind, it's best to respond to children's preferences in making the world a better place by noticing their own spiritual styles. The four literacies or spiritual styles are reading strategies that augment a child's ability to convey what they mean to make the world a better place based on their preferences for using word, emotion, symbol, or action. The following four scenarios describe each spiritual style. Nora's friends didn't understand why she'd rather talk about ideas than play soccer. She's part of the debate club at school and loves to hear two sides arguing over the meaning of a word. She loves to win the argument. Much of her time is spent with her nose in a book. She loves to know the precise meanings of things. She was angry in science class the other day when she asked about the meaning of a word her teacher was using. She thought the teacher's answer was inadequate because it left out a lot. Nora loves to defend her ideas at dinner. She corrects her brother, sister, and parents if they're not being clear. Nora's dad gets frustrated because she needs a detailed explanation of why something must be done rather than just doing what she's asked. When she makes decisions, she likes to tell people her reasons for acting the way she has and is frustrated if nobody listens. Nora feels compelled to do things if she has good reasons for it. She loves to write and hopes to be an author someday. Nora is a word person. Sarah loves her performing arts school. She's involved in the production of Wind in the Willows. She feels a sense of belonging with her friends singing and dancing on stage. Her friends love her and are drawn to her warm, infectious laugh. But sometimes they aren't sure she still likes them. Teachers praise her beautiful voice and her ability to light up the stage. Sarah often makes decisions based on how she feels, and sometimes this works out well. Other times her choices leave her with regret. She comes home after school flying high on interactions she's had during the day. Even though she spends time telling her mom about all her relationships, she says she doesn't have anyone who feels really close to her. She has a hard time completing homework. She calls friends on the phone or texts them during the time she said she'd do schoolwork. She often doesn't feel motivated if things are too quiet. Sarah knows something is important if she's moved to tears or is so exciting. She feels like dancing. Her goal in life is to make people happy. Alex is a nine-year-old boy who attends a private elementary school known for its high academic standards. Alex recently told his parents he doesn't fit in. He says the teachers overteach. They tell children what to think. They have no imagination, he told his parents. I can't be creative. I prefer to learn by exploring mysteries, not reading textbooks. Alex loves stories about the Bermuda Triangle and Stonehenge. They are mysterious and allow him to wonder. His teachers talk about the certainties of science and mathematics, but he can't help wondering about the mysterious world around him. 
Alex is often frustrated with the pace of his school day and wishes there were more time to quietly think about things. He feels there must be more to life than what he sees. When he sits quietly on the bank of the river across from his home, he sees wind blowing through the trees. He hears the water rushing past him. He feels at peace with the world and close to God. When Mark was four, he heard that people in Africa didn't have clean water and get sick. He was surprised. He knew it wasn't fair. How could he have so much clean water in Canada when others didn't have any? He knew he could do something to help. At five, he started to raise money to build a well in Africa. The whole idea of helping people in Africa got started when he built a little well in kindergarten while doing a project about pulleys and levers. He started collecting money in his well to build a real well in Africa. Mark wanted people to help his project. Some of them did. He was frustrated with people who didn't participate. Sometimes he was rude to them. He was passionate about getting clean water to people who didn't have it. He wanted to send money to Africa to build three wells, three sets of latrines, and three hand-washing stations. He wanted children to have clean water so they would be safe. When anyone asks Mark why he works on his projects, he says, this is my passion. This is what makes me feel good. Recognizing and augmenting a child's preferences for word, emotion, symbol, and action that they use to make the world a better place is foundational to spiritual care. Along with meeting their spiritual needs, developing children's attentiveness in these four spiritual literacies helps them mature conceptually. These reading street strategies create opportunities for children to talk about what really matters to them and to do so more articulately. Under favorable conditions, spiritual care provides environments in which children learn to care for one another, even at daycare. So I hope you read the article, find the citations and the resources, and um, yeah, participate in this project.